So let's imagine back in the day that you're a bacteria that's just floating around, you're running around free and doing your thing. And then all of a sudden there's just this, this virus that comes out of nowhere and tries to infect you. So here's this virus. Now the virus, what it does is once it infects this happy bacteria, it injects its DNA. So viral DNA is injected into the bacteria. Now the bacteria has its own bacterial DNA. That's this yellow, this yellow circle right here is the bacterial DNA. Now wouldn't it be nice if the bacteria could recognize its own DNA and chop up the viral DNA so that it can be protected from being infected by this virus? Well, that's actually exactly what ended up happening. So in order for the bacteria to be able to distinguish its own bacterial DNA from viral DNA, it labels its DNA. And the label is something known as methylation. So basically there's an enzyme known as methylase that goes and methylates the bacterial DNA. And I'll write that down over here. Methylase, which basically methylates bacterial DNA. And when the bacterial DNA is methylated, there's an enzyme known as a restriction enzyme that is able to recognize the methylated bacterial DNA and recognize that the viral DNA isn't methylated and it can actually chop up this viral DNA to protect the bacteria from infection. Now, why is it called a restriction enzyme? Well, back in 1950, the scientists that discovered restric restriction enzymes realized that some species of bacteria were able to protect themselves from viruses. So the virus was restricted from growing in specific bacteria and they were able to isolate the enzyme that was, uh, that was allowing the bacteria to protect itself from the virus. And that's where the restriction comes from. Now, in order for a restriction enzyme to work, it has to be able to recognize DNA. And it recognizes something known as a recognition sequence. Now, a recognition sequence is simply a sequence of DNA that's normally four to eight nucleotides long and is normally known as palindromic, palindromic. Now, what does palindromic mean? Well, basically, let's imagine that we have a sequence of DNA, so G, A, A, T, T, C. If we were to write the complement of this sequence, working this way, G, A, A, T, T, C. You might have noticed that if you read the sequence from left to right over here. It's exactly the same as this sequence if you read it from right to left. So GAA, GAA. Now that's what a palindromic sequence is. So these restriction enzymes generally are able to recognize palindromic sequences that are unmethylated. And if it recognizes an unmethylated palindromic sequence, it will go ahead and cleave it. So in this case, this palindromic sequence is recognized by a restriction enzyme known as ECOR1. Let me write that down over here, ECOR1. Now ECOR1, once it recognizes this palindromic sequence, will cleave it, it'll cut it, just like taking scissors to a piece of paper, it'll cut it. And it'll cut it along this blue line that I drew over here. And that results in two, two pieces of DNA floating around in the cell. The first piece looks like this, G-C-T-T-A-A, -A, and the second piece is this, this guy up here, over here. So it's A, A, T, T, C, and G. So these two pieces will be floating around um, the cell. And these ends over here, these ends that are kind of hanging over the edge, are known as sticky ends. And what would happen is eventually they would run into one another and then just re anneal and form hydrogen bonds. And it would basically uh, undo this cut that ECO R1 did. Now, what is the use of restriction enzymes? Why do we even care about restriction enzymes? Well, the very first use for them was to create something known as recombinant DNA. So recombinant DNA. Now, what is recombinant DNA? Well, let's imagine that you have two different species. So the first uh, species that was looked at was a frog. So let's imagine that you've got a frog here. I'm trying to draw a frog doesn't really look much like one, but use your imagination. So let's say that you've got a frog and you want to isolate its DNA. So let's say you take 
frog DNA. And let's say that you take a bacteria and you take bacterial DNA. And let's say that you want to combine the two. Well, what you can do is you just take the DNA, you add some EcoR1, and since EcoR1 will search both bacterial and frog DNA for this recognition sequence, it'll cleave it. And then you can have, let's say that you'll have the frog sticky end over here and then bacterial sticky end over here. Then those will recombine and then you've got basically one piece of DNA that has DNA from the frog and from the bacteria and that's known as recombinant DNA. Now a clinical application would be using instead of a frog you, you have a human. So let's say that you take human DNA, a human gene, combine it with bacterial DNA and that way you can produce a whole bunch of that human protein. And that's what was done for insulin. So insulin can be grown in bacteria. Um, and it's a much more efficient way of growing it than trying to uh, trying to take it from humans and isolate it and purify it and things like that. So that's the use of recombinant DNA in this uh, restriction enzyme.